Good morning. So, Firefox is a very big project. There's a reason why people keep talking about, oh, something big is coming into Firefox, something big is coming in Rust into Firefox. And that's because Firefox is a really big C++ project. It is over 9 million lines just of C++ by itself. Um, and then there's other languages, uh, languages on top of that. Um, and the engine um, that's written mostly in C++, we tend to refer to as Gecko. And Gecko has a style system, which is a component I'll explain in a little bit, um, which is by itself about 160,000 lines of C++ code. And this is something that's been around for almost two decades now and has like, evolved over time and grown larger and larger and more complex. So, the new thing, Stylo, is 85,000 lines of handwritten Rust. And that is an important qualifier, which uh, we'll, we'll explore later. But this is what is coming to Firefox um, in about two weeks. It's going to be shipping. And that's really exciting. It's been a number of years of effort to get to this point. So let's talk about what a style system actually is in a web browser. So a web browser basically contains a pipeline um, to get bytes from the network um, and then turn them into something that shows up in front of you. So it starts with the HTML parser. Um, and this takes the source code of an HTML page, which contains your HTML tags and everything, um, as, as an input. And as an output, it turns that into a tree of what are called DOM nodes. Um, and these, co these correspond to those tags. Um, everything inside of a pair of match tags um, becomes an element, and everything, or everything inside of that, that pair of match tags becomes children, child nodes of that element. So here, the HTML has two children, and each of those children each have one child by themselves. So after that, if we come across any CSS text um, while parsing the page, we'll then feed that into the CSS parser. And CSS is the language that allows you to style your page um, based on its contents. So we might see that there is, uh, there's, there's some CSS text that says, oh, make all spans turn red, but make any div element that has a header ID um, make that text green. And so that's the input, and the output of the CSS parser is what we call list of style rules. And these are rules that are easier for the CSS um, engine to interpret later without having to parse the text over and over. So the next step we go through is the cascade. And this is from the name of CSS that stands for cascading style sheets. That means that for every element in the tree, we will proceed through the tree um, and apply these style rules based on these inputs we're given. Um, and figure out what the actual computed styles for each node should be. What color, in this case, is each element going to be based on these rules? So we look and see, oh, we, have, uh, we see that we have a div with an ID header, so we can apply the style rule to turn that green, and that gets inherited by all of its children. But that gets overridden by the span, which says, oh, I should be red. So we take the result of these computed styles, and then we feed them into the layout component. And that's what takes both your, your, your tree of nodes um, and, and their, their actual um, style information that we've computed, and then says, OK, based on these computed styles, where should we actually draw boxes? What is the size of each box? How does it relate to its children and parents? What, how are they aligned together? Um, that layout is what takes all that information and turns it into something that you could end up visually seeing. And so the style system, when we talk about it, encompasses a number of these steps. It encompasses parsing the CSX, parsing the CSX, CSS. Um, it also incorporates the cascade um, and turning everything into a series of computed styles. Uh, it also incorporates introspection. So JavaScript is able to ask your web page what is the computed style of a particular element. Um, and it can also look into what are the contents of the style sheets that the browser knows about. Furthermore, there's CSS animations, and the style system is, is responsible for processing those at any given time and figuring out what the values um, that are being animated should be. Um, and finally, whenever a page is modified, then the style system is responsible for determining what is the most optimal way of recomputing all that information, um, because it turns out it's not actually very performant if you go and iterate over the entire tree of all nodes every single time you make a change to just one of them. So you might ask, if we have this thing which has been working for decades in Firefox, what is, what is the reason we would want to go to all this effort to replace it? And really, the answer is performance. Um, performance is a key driver of all web browsers. 
Um, and any time we see something which could be improved, we start to think maybe we should be improving it. Maybe we're just leaving performance on the table otherwise. And the reason why um, performance is so key here is that the cascade that I talked about, it actually fits the model of what we call an embarrassingly parallel problem. Um, and what that means is we iterate over each node in the tree. And all we're doing at this point is just reading some data from the parent and reading some data from the style rules that we computed earlier and reading some data from the actual node in the tree. And then we create something new based on combining all that information, which means that it should be possible to distribute that, uh, that work um, throughout a bunch of different CPUs and get um, potentially even linear speed ups based on the number of CPUs you have. So if you have two CPUs, in theory, we could do uh, the cascade twice as fast if we, if we use both of them um, at full capacity. If you have four CPUs, we might be able to do it in a quarter of the time. That's a pretty exciting prospect. However, as much as it sounds like it should be a straightforward, uh, straightforward operation to perform, it turns out that it is more complicated than that. Um, and there's been two attempts to do this in Firefox itself, in C++, um, in the past few years. So one was a group of grad students at UC Irvine, um, and they had an advisor working at Intel, and they published a paper on their efforts to measure and, and um, do more of the work in parallel, um, and it seemed to go really well, except that the resulting code was difficult to maintain, there was a lot of duplication, it was difficult to reason about, and in general, it didn't actually look like the most important thing to spend time on, given how many other parts of Firefox we could be focusing on. And similarly, in 2011, we decided to give it to an intern, which surprised me, but uh, it came up with a patch, and it seemed to be working, but there were these mysterious crashes that were really difficult to track down. Um, it was hard to debug. It was, again, hard to maintain. And so, again, it just languished there because no one really saw this as a high priority when it turned out to be more complicated than people assumed. So, Let's talk about Servo. Servo is the web browser engine we've been building since 2012, um, completely from the ground up in Rust, with a couple minor exceptions. But in general, we're, we're, learning, we're taking lessons we've learned from building browsers over the past decade, um, no matter Firefox or Chrome or WebKit or something. Um, we're looking at the best choices made in those browsers and trying to build something new in Rust that gets um, the benefits of more modern hardware. In particular, we're trying to build things in parallel from the start and we have a strong focus on building things uh, in a very modular fashion. And what this means is that the style system in Servo, not only did we build something in parallel in 2013, um, but also it exists in its own crate and it's got strong trait interfaces and this means that it is much more feasible to look at extracting just the style system from Servo and putting it into another project like Firefox. Um, and it's much more feasible to contemplate that than it is to do something like the reverse, of taking something out of Firefox, which is sort of a gargantuan, monolithic thing, um, and try to extract it into something else. So we started looking into whether this would be possible in 2015, and that was our, the, the sort of lead developer of this project. Um, he did a bunch of investigations. He said, okay, if we make these changes to these interfaces, I can get this very basic demo um, styling the Wikipedia page for Barack Obama um, and using multiple CPUs, and that would be great. And then, there, then he came up with a list of all the different things we needed to do to make it um, actually fit um, everything that Firefox could do. Um, and so in 2016, that work happened, um, and the team has been growing and growing um, to, to get this work done uh, to, in order to ship in two weeks. So the actual process of integrating this code um, is, is interesting because Firefox exists in a single monolithic repo. All the Firefox code exists in a mercurial repo um, and the servo code exists in a GitHub repository and has a bunch of different crates and some of them are important and some of them are not. Um, and servo also chooses to make use of the crates.io ecosystem. It's been really great. Um, but what it means is that for Firefox, this is a problem because Firefox uh, uses continuous integration servers which don't have any external network access. And that goes against the model that is traditionally followed by uh, cargo projects. So what happens is Firefox actually vendored the entire source code of Servo into the Firefox repository um, and then also vendored all of the dependencies of Servo into the Firefox repository, um, which is an interesting stress test for all sorts of different systems, it turns out. 
And honestly, I wouldn't actually recommend following this path. Um, it, I'm glad we did for Servo, but it's actually quite a pain. So let's talk about how this actually fits together. Uh, there's a crate in the Servo source code called Gecko Lib, um, and that contains all of the APIs that the Gecko C++ code can invoke in order to call into the Servo style system. Um, there's a header file called servo binding list.h in the C++ Gecko code, um, which has equivalent C declarations for all of those functions. Um, because the way that you can do cross-language interaction like this is by pretending that you have a C function in Rust code. And then the C code goes, oh, I know how to invoke C code. That's great. I'll just be able to call right into that. So all of the uh, APIs that can be invoked from Gecko code start with the prefix servo underscore. Um, and the, the only interesting bit here is that uh, we don't have any automatic synchronization here. So if you make a change to the servo APIs that are provided in the Rust code, um, and you change, like you add an argument to something, that means you also need to update this header file, otherwise you can get um, surprising program behavior, um, sometimes even crashes. So as an example, here is the API that the style system, uh, or the, the code in Gecko that invokes the style system from Servo uh, calls. It says, uh, it's called Servo Traverse Subtree, and it is given um, a, a root node to start traversing from, and it's given some data that Servo needs in order to do that, and some other things um, which Servo also needs. And it returns a Boolean, which I presume means um, either it, the, the result is uh, like needs, needs some more processing afterwards or is ready to go. Um, and similarly, then we have the equivalent C declaration that lives in the header file for this. Um, and it uses types that, uh, that match the, the types that the Rust code receives. So everything should just be passed across this, uh, this sort of foreign function interface boundary um, without having any problems. So on the other hand, it would be nice if we could just encapsulate all of this new behavior inside this function, you know, traverse subtree, and then just have that happen, and when, when it comes back, it's done. That'd be great. However, it turns out that Firefox is a bit more complicated than that, and it turns out that the Rust code also needs to call back into C++ um, and sometimes go back and forth a few times. And that means that we need to declare APIs that the Rust code can call, because um, it knows how to invoke C code as well. So there's another header file called servo bindings, which has the C APIs that can be called from Rust. And these all start with the gecko underscore prefix. Um, and these, on the other hand, are generated by using the program bind gen. Um, or the, the Rust side declarations are generated by bindgen, which looks at a C header file and spits out all the Rust declarations you need in order to use those types and in call those functions. It's very handy. So the C API for creating an error reporter, because um, in Firefox, a CSS error that gets, uh, they, or if there's an error in your CSS code that gets processed, then we want to notify the developer tools in the browser about that. So Servo doesn't know anything about Firefox's developer tools. It needs to just have this interface of this error reporter. And it says, okay, Gecko, create me an error reporter. I'll be able to use it later. And so there's the C API for doing that. Um, and then similarly, there's this Rust declaration that allows Servo to actually invoke this when necessary. So, as I said, we use bindgen to avoid any mistakes. It just generates everything automatically, and if you ever update the C APIs or the, um, that, that Gecko provides, then those automatically get reflected into the Rust bindings um, at, at build time, which means that if you add a parameter to the C ones, um, then you'll get a compile error in any uses of that API in the Rust code because it says, oh, there's, you know, you're not passing a parameter that's necessary. And that's very convenient. You don't get any crashes or unexpected behavior that way. It's also extremely slow because we end up processing dozens or hundreds of header files, um, and it's extremely easy to make a change to a header file which doesn't actually matter to Rust, but is transitively included by something, and then that you have to run this whole bindgen process again. So that's a bit of a frustration for us. So there's sort of two main ways that you can focus on doing your, your cross-language uh, interaction. You can either encapsulate uh, these, these operations behind functions, um, or you can dive directly into the types and manipulate them, like manipulate C types from the Rust code or Rust types from the C code. 
Um, either one is possible, but it turns out that there's a bit of a trade-off either way um, that usually rev revolves around performance versus safety. So it turns out that every time you call a function, um, in general, if you're calling like a Rust function from Rust code, the compiler says, oh, I know what that function is, I can see how big it is, it would probably make sense just to inline that code directly rather than going through the process of performing a call, pushing things onto the stack, jumping, returning back, all these things that uh, usually happen. Um, and that's fine, but every time you do a cross language function call, the compiler doesn't know anything about that and can't avoid this. And that means that if you're going back and forth between languages um, during code that is performance sensitive, then that can be a problem. I mean, the benefit of using a function is that if you have invari invariance around um, what your data model is doing, around what your types are supposed to be doing, you can assert those, um, you can have safety checks, and that is very helpful. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. So as an example of this, um, there's, there's one piece in, in uh, Stylo where we need to talk to Gecko to say, okay, this particular thing, um, we need to make sure it is marked as being an image element. Um, and there's too much involved there for us to really do that from the Rust code. So it's just a simple function call um, to one of these C APIs that were declared earlier. Um, and the actual Gecko definition, first it asserts that you're actually passing a valid image, um, and secondly it then invokes a method, a C++ method on that type, um, and does something funky with reference counting re related to the kind of, um, or the name of the, uh, the element that you're interacting with. This is all stuff that is much easier to just push onto the Gecko side rather than try to replicate that into the Rust side. Um, so on the other hand, if you're using types, then you have the option to just dive directly into the memory um, and start modifying things. Um, and there's no performance penalty for this. It's just, it's just a memory, you have pointers to it, you can reach in and set things or read things, um, and it's up to you to make sure that you're actually following the model and, and not breaking the system. Um, I think the downside here is that if you do have rules around what's allowed and what isn't, suddenly that logic is now distributed between like two completely separate files and two different source trees, um, and that, that might not be a good trade-off. But for performance sensitive code, maybe that's what you want. Um, an example of where we do this, um, I particularly like that like, there's this comment that explains what properties of the model that we're relying on um, in order to do this mucking around inside uh, a C type from the Rust code. In this case, we have a, a raw pointer to a C type, um, and we're getting a mutable pointer to a field inside an array that's stored inside that type, and then setting um, a particular field of, of that um, subfield to another Rust value that the C code will eventually understand when it, when it gets back there. So we actually did something interesting um, with dealing with these, with these types um, between languages. So BindGen will typically just give you declarations which involve raw pointers everywhere. Um, and that's fine. You know, raw pointers are a thing that you're used to using in C, for example. Um, and it's, it's not that bad to go back to using them in Rust. But we did something where we started naming or creating these types in, in Rust which wrap raw pointers, but um, they have particular extra meaning associated with them. So for example, we created this, uh, this generic type called owned, which represents a, a raw pointer that was originally created from a value like a box in Rust. Um, and so the idea here is we create this value in Rust as a box, and then we turn it into this owned value, and then pass it over to the C++ code. And it gets moved around, it gets stored places, and eventually it comes back to Rust in the form of an owned value, and we say, okay, we know that it is owned, therefore we can turn it back into a box, and it will be deallocated safely and properly. And we have this idea of ownership that persists across the language barrier, even though C++ does not have the same kind of um, ownership model as uh, Rust does. So BindGen does this for us automatically. We have a list of types that will just see the C++ type, for example, raw servo style set owned, and it'll say, okay, I know that I need to turn this into this actual more complex Rust type which is the same under the hood. So in C++, it's just a raw pointer, but it has the same name, and we have a, uh, a function which is declared from Rust, um, which says, oh, I accept this raw servo style set owned. Whereas on the Rust side, we say, okay, it's not just a raw pointer, it is actually this type called owned um, that specializes on this underlying raw pointer, 
Um, and in the actual definition of servo style set drop, we accept this owned value and then turn it into a box which will be deallocated because we know what's going on here. And we do the same for other um, interesting types. So we have types that have borrowed attached to the name and by and gen, we'll turn those into um, uh, traditional Rust references for us. And similarly, borrowed or null, which will be a raw pointer, which might be null, we then turn into an option value around a Rust reference, which gives us much nicer ergonomics and prevents us accidentally dereferencing null pointers. So let's talk about this parallel style system stuff. Um, we built it back in 2013, it was handwritten, um, and it worked fine. But we switched to Rayon in 2016, and that's worked out really well for us. Um, Rayon is the library that's written and shared by lots of different projects that do things in parallel. It provides a safe abstraction over um, sort of unsafe operations of distributing work around uh, multiple workers. Um, and so not only did we make some changes to Rayon to better accommodate our use cases, we also have made use of changes that other people from other projects have um, added to Rayon, and that's been a really nice sort of synergistic relationship there. So the idea in, in Stylo is that we have a queue of unstyled nodes, um, and it will initially be a single node, and that'll be the root of a tree. So there's a pool of worker threads that are waiting for work, and as soon as work becomes available, they'll start trying to grab it off of the queue. So when a worker grabs something off the queue, it'll say, okay, this is my node, no one else can style it. I will now proceed and do the cascade on this particular node, and I can always reach the parent which is already styled um, to get that information. And when I'm done styling this node, I'll write that information, or I'll write the computed style to the node, and only then will I retrieve the unstyled children of that now styled node, um, and add those to the queue for other workers to then access because this now provides a safe data dependency where no other workers will be trying to interact with an unstyled parent while it's being styled. So the, the problem we're trying to deal with here is that parallel code in general has some problems. Um, and that's that code executes simultaneously and, and sharing data is a problem. So if, if they only read the same data, that's fine. Everyone can read the same thing, you get a consistent view of the world. But if you're reading and writing, then you end up with a problem. Um, because you can get inconsistency showing up. Or if different things are writing at the same time, still more inconsistency, that's no good. The Rust compiler protects us against these problems, um, but there is an issue. And that is when we go into C++ from a worker thread that's running on a, on a, th on a thread, um, we lose the ability of the Rust compiler to protect us. And that means that a C++ method like get root element as shown here, um, it turns out it's a problem because it actually has a little internal cache. The first time it's called, it'll look for a root element, it'll say, oh great, okay, we can do this faster next time if I just store this uh, as a member in, in this class. But what happens if you have two different workers which both call it at the same time for the first time and they both try to write to the same um, thing together or read it at the same time? Turns out this causes a crash. And it's really difficult to actually spot problems like this. For a while, our lead developer was trying to keep track of like reading through the code, thinking really hard about what would be called at any given time, and thinking, okay, is this safe? This is probably safe. Uh, I, this might be safe. Maybe this isn't safe. Um, and that doesn't really scale, it turns out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it turns out we, we came up with some simple rules to avoid this. If we said that um, the, the code being called from these worker threads was only allowed to write to local variables. Those would not be observed by any other workers. They can read from anything because no one's writing to anything. And the main thread, which is usually the one doing all the writing, doesn't get to run. If we follow those rules, could we get the compiler to help us do this? And the answer is yes. We have a compiler plugin for GCC which performs static analysis on all functions that start with the gecko prefix. So all of those APIs that can be called from Rust it will go and explore every single possible code path that could ever execute in any universe. And it will see, okay, are any writes occurring in any of these code paths to anything that is not a local variable? If so, that is an error. And that means we now have the compiler helping us and telling us whether anything um, could end up causing a crash by being called from um, these, these Rust uh, workers. And this is kind of scary because we found over 30 pre-existing problems from code that was like a decade old um, that was only now causing us problems because we were doing this on threads. Um, and it saved us so many times as we kept trying to introduce new problems. We were like, oh, this is great, I'll just call this function. And it's like, nope, you can't. <laughs> 
So let's talk a little bit about some pain points um, that came from this, this, uh, this work. First one is memory usage. Firefox is really sensitive about memory usage. There's a sort of uh, a long-standing meme that like there's a leak in Firefox and it'll just keep growing um, over time. So we, we fixed that a few years ago. So that's no big deal. But we're really careful not to like keep having memory usage increase. Um, and we have infrastructure which uh, is good at measuring current heap usage throughout the program. Um, but it needs pointers to the actual allocated buffer in order to be able to report those. And that's fine in, in the Gecko code because we wrote our own standard library, um, so we have all those pointers everywhere. We can dig into everything. Um, Rust doesn't actually give us that in all cases, though. And it turns out that hash maps both are extremely important to the style system and are pervasive everywhere, and they also get really big sometimes. So it turns out that we were lacking significant ability to measure the memory usage of this new style system um, that we created. Um, so another problem that we came across is that uh, we really love enums. Like enums are fantastic and being able to match on them is wonderful and every, every new Rust developer that worked on Stylo um, got really excited about enums and you know, sang their praises. But it turns out that enums have a ability to like grow over time as you keep nesting them. Um, so let's imagine a CSS property called border left style, which could have three different values. Um, it's either none, or solid, or a dashed border. We might represent that as an enum uh, with three states, you know, none, solid, or dashed, and it has uh, you know, a pixel value for like, how big the spaces should be. So under the hood, this is gonna be eight bytes. You've got four bytes for the actual U32 value that is stored in the enum, and you also have four bytes for the tag, which indicates what kind of uh, what kind of, what, what state this value is in at any given time. And that's unavoidable. So, we might look at that and go, okay, well, the none state, that seems redundant. Why don't we just put this inside of an option? Options are much nicer to use, we get better ergonomics. So if we just have an option around this enum, we only need two states inside of it, um, and now it turns out that border style value is still the same size, it still has a four byte tag, and it still needs to store four bytes for the U32 value but the option value is also has its own tag, and that's four bytes. And then it needs to store the eight bytes for the nested enum, so in total, your option value is now 12 bytes, um, even though it's still, it's still uh, representing the same amount of data. Now, we might look at this and say, what if the dashed width was optional? What if you didn't actually, like, what if there was like a default that would be specified automatically? You might say, okay, well, let's make the option inside the dashed Thing. Um, so now we have an option of an enum that contains an option sometimes. So this adds up. The option U32 is itself eight bytes, four bytes for the tag, four bytes for the value. Then you've got the border style value, which has four bytes for the tag, and now it stores an eight byte enum. And the overall enum is still four byte tag, now it stores eight bytes for the value. So you've got 16 bytes for storing the, you know, almost the exact same amount of information now. So our option here is that we could flatten this automatically, or not automatically, but we can flatten this manually and put this all back into a single enum that contains all the different states. Um, you have none, and then you also have a dash none state um, instead of having an option inside of it. And so now you're back to one enum, and it's back to four by, uh, or it's back to eight bytes in total because you only need to store four bytes for the U32 value. Um, but this isn't this isn't a delightful solution because you no longer get the ergonomics that you associate with option values. So trading off between ergonomics or space um, is, you know, not my favorite thing. So um, another thing we came across is that the, the arc values um, contain weak pointers. Um, and this is something the style doesn't actually use. And this means that there's an extra four or eight bytes per thing you allocate inside of an arc wrapper. Um, and we do that a lot in Servo. So, there, there seemed to be some discussion going on about whether this is necessary. Um, we decided that we should just fork ARC um, to get rid of it. Um, compiling time, kind of not wonderful all the time. There's you know, 300,000 lines of Rust code after you go through all the code generation just for the largest crate. Um, and that isn't easy to, to do quick work on. Um, you know, minute 30 for a debug build, but performance is terrible. Meanwhile, six and a half minutes um, for a release build if you get good performance. Um, and we only use stable Rust, so we can't try a lot of the new things which are coming out recently. <coughs> um, and finally, fallible allocation 
it's really important for Firefox because we need to be able to not break the browser if you know you run out of memory or or some web content says you know gives you content that is really really large. That's no good. Um, and this is in particularly important on Windows for us because it has very different behavior than other river platforms. So, you know, this isn't great. There's an RFC being discussed, but it's not ready yet, and we needed to be able to ship. And we were seeing crash reports of failed allocations coming up heavily on Windows. Standard library doesn't allow it, so we forked HashMap. It's disappointing. Um, also, we duplicated some stuff to do that with Vex as well. Um, things that went really well, Deriving traits has saved us so much time, been able to fix entire classes of errors and make it impossible to do them. Um, that's been really great. Thread safety, like I said earlier, it has saved us so much time not making mistakes when doing things with threaded code. Um, the fact that people are really happy to write asserts in their code means that we've caught bugs that have been lurking in Firefox around the old style system that were just swept under the rug, but they now panic in the new style system and we've caught bugs that are a decade old because of this. That's pretty cool. Um, and crates.io has been very helpful. There's lots of really great packages we depend upon. Um, so I want to leave you with this final conversation I oversaw, uh, or I overheard in, in an IRC channel from some of the long-term Firefox developers um, who have been saying that they, they have found using Rust for Stylo to be an incredibly positive experience. The lead developer, uh, someone who's been working on Firefox for like seven or eight years at this point, um, he said, you know, the best part about Stylo has been how much easier it's been to implement these optimizations um, that we needed. And it, like, it's because of Rust that that's possible. Um, and like, can you imagine if we needed to do this in the time frame that we've been, if we needed to like rewrite all this in the time frame but in C++, like that would be ridiculous. Um, and in, additionally, like we run fuzzers against this new code and it's actually extremely rare for those fuzzers to find bugs in the Rust implementation itself. Um, and that's really impressive. Like we have a long history of seeing lots of fuzzing bugs in the C++ code for the old style system. And you know, imagine if we could just like save time by trading all of those compiler errors for like just <laughs> bugs we would find later. It'd be so much easier to ship. Um, and yeah, someone else pointed out that like this is, we should just put this on a billboard. This is just a great ad for, for the powers of rest. So thanks for listening. I hope this has been useful. I'd love to talk to you later.